I'm Jeff Wright, and welcome to the Blame to Fame podcast. As an entrepreneur, I have not only built an extremely successful business from scratch, but also employed thousands of men and women and helped them on their path to financial freedom. One of the most common themes for me and everyone else who has succeeded is that we never blame anyone and are aware that our success or failures fall solely on our shoulders. It was not until I hit rock bottom that I realized that only I alone could change my future. And on my podcast, you're going to hear the stories of successful folks who have gone from blame to fame in their own lives. I look forward to sharing my journey and great guests that will educate you about their path to success. Please join me each week on the Blame to Fame podcast. I'm Jeff Wright, and welcome to Blame to Fame, where we want to show you how to take all the blame that you have in your life to burn as fuel to take you to the next level. Today, we have Mr. Jason Duncan on from Nashville, Tennessee. Jason is the host of the Root of All Success podcast and the founder of Results University, helping entrepreneurs build, scale, and enjoy their businesses even teaching them how to survive when the shit hits the fan. Jason, how you doing, brother? I'm great. It is good to see you, man. Well, tell it's great seeing you. Thanks for being on. The shit hits the fan a lot lately, doesn't it? Yes, our, uh, our illustrious government sure makes sure that happens. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's not, you know, I have to admit, you know, as much as we all talk about positivity and, 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 and trying to get rid of negative thoughts and all that, you know, I, I, I get in a funk just like everyone else does. I'm, I'm sure you get in a funk every now and then. And um, it, there's lots of ways that I do to try to push past it. What, what do you do in that, in that situation? Well, I, I think that, <clears throat> I think that positivity, of course, is important as you were talking about, but I think it's just a general mindset about looking looking for the good things. Negative self talk is terrible. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I'm not into the I'm not into the whole mushy gushy. You know, got to say 15 affirmations or you don't have a good day. That, that, that's not how I live. But I do understand and appreciate and believe in the science, the brain science behind behind that because I'm a generally a positive person. And when I get around negative Nellies, naysayers, no, you know, those types of people that yeah. are all just no, I don't enjoy being around that. And, and it's a, it's a shame because they, they it's almost like a self fulfilling prophecy. They they say, well, I'm having a bad day. Well, yeah. Okay. We all have bad days, but did you say you're having a bad day before you had a bad day or <laughs> <laughs> which one but, was it? You know, your, your mind just makes so many crazy assumptions. Uh, the thing I was in the funk about, which I think anyone would understand, my daughter who lives in Atlanta uh, had to be hospitalized last week. So I had to uh, make a last minute trip and fly up there. I slept in a chair for four days uh, and it just makes you feel powerless. You know, she's yelling, screaming, and there's nothing you can do. And she's screaming to me, you know, dad, am I going to die? Is this, you know, and then, and then the worst thing she did was pick up her damn phone and start Googling whatever the doctor said. And oh. it just, it just made it even worse. Um, so it, 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 so I, I pushed past it. It was, it was really hard because like I said, it's your little girl, but I know oftentimes in business, we will have things like that that will that will come and and will put us in a funk and 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 will actually affect everything. Mm -hmm. Is your is your daughter okay? She she is she is she came home uh, she came home Saturday and now she got readmitted. But I think that they found out uh, what her problem is, so hopefully they can get that solved. Mm, yeah, well, it's always it's even more um funkifying <laughs> when it's yeah. dealing with individuals that we love and people that are close to us and there's a help because business stuff comes and goes i mean i i, I guess it was tim ferris who in his book four hour work week said a long long time ago when he wrote he's like you know when you're thinking about possible outcomes of what's going to mm -hmm. happen with this thing you're going to try you need to think about what is the absolute worst what is the worst outcome possible in, yeah. in the business 
and, and almost never ends in death. It never ends in death because, you know, most of us are not dealing in that. I mean, I, I assume that there's probably going to be a person or two out there. So yeah, if I screw up in my business, somebody dies, but really that doesn't happen for most of us. So we've got to accept the fact that the worst possible outcome is really not even that bad. I mean, if you, no. is it bankruptcy? Is it losing money? Is it losing the house? Is it losing the car? You know, shutting the business down. All those things are terrible, but mm -hmm. you know, that's not that bad in the overall scheme of things. No, I mean, you know, one of the things that I've learned because, you know, over the years, you know, I, I have been to every continent except Antarctica. I've been to every third world shithole you could think of. Um, it, 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 it does a lot of things. It, travel makes you grateful for where you live, for, for one thing. But the one thing, too, is that what I learned from those experiences and really in any experience that, that I've had, Nothing is ever, in, in my case, I have never experienced anything that was as bad as my mind was telling me it was going to be. Yeah. I, I've never had that experience, not once, where anything was as bad as that. And so I think a lot of times, uh, you know, in business, uh, it, it, you know, people, people ask, well, what's the worst that could happen? Well, the worst that could happen is you could, you could risk, it. you know, you could lose everything, you know, this could happen, but you know, there's two things. Number one, it probably won't, it probably won't be as bad as you think it is, not unless you just totally mismanage what you're doing. But the other thing too, is that if you don't lay that risk out there, you're never going to know. So you, you have to, you know, you, you have to, if, if you want to fall in love, you have to risk being rejected. If you want to succeed in business, you have to risk losing something. It's just like learning the walk. If you want to learn how to walk, you have to learn the risk of falling down. Right. I, there's a worry study that was it's referred to as the worry study. It probably has a better name than that. But this worry study that came out several years ago and it said, it actually studied a, a, a long over a long period of time, a lot big group mm -hmm. of people it said 80%, 80% of the things that people worried about never happened. Now we've heard that before, you yeah. know, I've heard that people, yeah. but it's actual a real study. 80% wow. of the things they worried about never happened. And then out of the, uh, the 20% of things that ended up happening, <laughs> uh, there was like 80, 80 or 85% of those things either were better than what they expected or taught them a lesson that made their life better. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, the study revealed that 97% of the things we worry about ain't that big of a deal. <laughs> oh, no, you're right. And, and I think that I think the problem with that, too, is the is the type of information that we take in from the wrong people yeah. like like i traveled around the middle east and before i went i was telling some people that i was going to the middle east and they were telling me oh my god you're gonna get your head chopped off you're gonna get your hands chopped off you know all this bad shit's gonna happen to you but have any of those people ever been to the middle east no none of them have so i've talked to people that had been in, over there and they said oh god you're gonna enjoy it you're gonna have the time of your life and they were right I, re I really did. It's, it's quite a culture. Uh, I, I really loved it over there. But, uh, uh, you know, a lot of times you're getting information. You know, it's just like, you know, with the pandemic, everybody turned to, to, out to be a medical expert. Now everybody's a foreign affairs expert, you know, who know nothing about stuff. So I think a lot of it has to do with the type of information that you're taking in and who you're taking it from. <laughs> So in my mastermind, the Exeter Club, one of the rules in our mastermind is that we don't allow ultra crepidarianism. <laughs> and most people have never heard of that before. I've never heard of that. So so it's it's an actual thing. And what you were just describing is what it is. Ultra okay. crepidarians are, is the person. Ultra crepidarianism, of course, is when you do it, is when you espouse opinion as fact on things that you don't know. Yeah. Well, you, you tell your opinion as fact on things you don't know. So think about the people in your life that are ultra crepidarians. You know, they're telling you, you know, well, the thing about it is here's what you need to do. And they're like, and you're like, you don't have any clue. <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about now. So what we do in our mastermind, and this is what I recommend for all people leave masterminds is, is explain ultra crepidarianism because people like that word and they, oh, that's kind of neat. But then you say, well, here's, so how do you do it? If, if, if we're going around and doing a mastermind group and 
And Jeff says something that I, I absolutely don't know anything about, but I have an idea. So what you're supposed to say is, you know, I don't have any experience in that at all, but it seems to me like this might work. So you might want to give that a shot. That's the way you'd handle it. Not, well, this is how you got to do it. Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. I've never heard of that, but that is so true because everybody will tell you what you need to do. You know, it, it's like, I was talking to someone the other day who was talking about starting their own business. And they said, well, you know, my, my parents don't, don't think it's a, uh, it's a great idea for me to do it. Okay. What does your dad do? Or my dad's a postal worker. Uh, what does your mom do? Oh, my, my mom uh, was a manager at, at, at some uh, uh, auto parts store or something like that. These people had never run a business in their life yet. They're giving they're, 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 they're giving their opinions on, on what their son should or shouldn't do when they really have no clue about what they should do because they've never taken the risk to do it. That's right. That is right. Don't take, don't take financial advice from broke people. Don't take no. business advice from your lawyer. You know, there's, there's all kinds of cool, cool parts of that that we could say there's people that know stuff and you should learn from them on that stuff, but don't learn that stuff from other people who don't know that stuff. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and I think the, the underlying thing about that, that keeps, that holds people back. I think, I think the biggest thing that holds back people's potential in business or anything else is the simple thing of if they fail, what other people are going to think of them. Oh, they yes. have this preconceived notion of, of what other people are going to think of them. And I tell people, stop caring that other people, you know, stop caring about what other people think and stop thinking that they really care in the first place. Yeah, there's Osho had a great quote. Uh, I think he's an Indian philosopher. He said that, the greatest fear that men need to overcome is the fear of other people's opinions. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. And that, and we all deal with that. It's the imposter syndrome, especially those of us in the public figure life, mm -hmm. you know, for podcasters or authors or public speakers or coaches, you know, we, we put our, we, we have to put ourselves out there because that's how we get known and how people will come to us for, for the assistance that we are hoping to provide. But, but when you start that journey, except for the rare egotistical people among us that we don't, nobody likes is that yeah. we all are a little bit in, we have these inhibition or the, these, uh, these inhibitions that keep us from, from putting ourselves out there because we're afraid. Well, what happens if they think, you know, what happens if the guy I went to high school with discovers that I'm doing this and he's going to tell everybody that I'm a fraud? Well, really? Like that guy doesn't know anything yeah. about me. That's a long time ago, but we still feel those fears. And I've dealt with that a lot too. There's a lot of fears and, and people, you know, fears of what people might say and could say and what they think. And I've got a, I've got a personal situation that, that happened to me a few years ago with a business partner. And uh, it was terrible and unfortunate. And I regret it. I hate it. I hate that it happened. Um, but, but I guess probably the worst part about it is he poisoned a lot of mutual friends against me for, for no yeah. good reason. And it wasn't even required. It didn't need to happen. Yeah. And, um, and so at some part of me is like, I worry a little bit about what they think. And then the other part is like, I don't care. Like, I know it's not true. I don't, I'm not worried about it. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's no reason. I mean, one of the things that, that I do in, in my coaching with my insurance group, uh, you know, we, we accept people in it to try to take them to the next level. And the first thing I try to get them to do, or, or what I have found to be one of the most effective ways um, to get them to stop caring about what other people think is to simply pick up a phone, flip it around and do a selfie video on Facebook live. And I actually make them send me the live links to, to what they are. And you, I mean, you would know, but a lot of people would have no idea how petrified people are to do a selfie video. Just to, just to talk into their phone for, you know, 20, 40, 60 seconds, just in fear of what other people are, uh, are going to think about them. You know, what, what my neighbors are going to think I'm crazy. My sister's going to think I'm nuts. I'm going to look stupid. My hair's going to look bad. I'm going to talk funny. But most of the time when they do that, the feedback that they start getting is actually quite the opposite. People will tell them, hey, I'm glad you got on there. I like because it's a very small minority of people uh, out there 
that will actually do something like that. But it's a great way to break shyness and to shed the caring about what other people think, just simply doing live videos on your phone. Yep, you're right. It, it's some some people are easier have an easier time at it than others, but it, all of us got to get over it. I was talking to a talking to somebody earlier today, a potential new client of mine, and she was talking about, you know, she's a coach. She wants to she's she wants she's in the health coaching space. She wants to get known and sure. and uh, start her business, get her business running. And she she admitted she hates doing social media. She hates doing the videos. She hates doing. And I said, well, listen, I, I, you might hate it, but it is a absolute an absolute requirement. If you're going to be in the coaching space, you have to do it. There's no way around it. You've got to present yourself. Uh, I mean, Tony Robbins, I think probably arguably the number one coach in the world, but he does videos all the time too, and he doesn't even need to. But it's just continuing to drive that brand, the image, to make sure that people know he's there, and uh, you know we all have to do. It. Well. Uh, and I was telling my wife this, my wife's a doctor, she has a clinic. And when she started it, I told her, you're going to have to start doing videos. You're going to have to be the face. Because if you look at, like, I live in Tampa, Florida. Um, we have this big personal injury law firm. They claim to be the biggest in the, the biggest law firm in America. And you cannot swing a dead cat and not hit one of his billboards here or you cannot turn on television, or I can't even, even social media, I see his stuff pop up all the time. You know, this guy actually probably hasn't represented a case in 15 years, but he's still the face of the company. And anybody that's successful is always going to be the face of, of their company. You know, even, even Warren Buffett's the face, the face of, of Berkshire Hathaway. Um, you, you know, it, it's just something... You, you have to do and you have to get over what other people are going to think about it. That's right. You got to get over it. That's a good title for something podcast or a book. Just get oh, over it. Oh, absolutely. Get over <laughs> it. Get over it. You know, we, uh, uh, you know, Omar Marina Madrano by any chance? Yeah. I had him on my podcast recently. Yeah. He's such a cool guy, isn't he? Yeah, he is. Yeah. And, and I love, I love the book that he did. It's like, what if it did work? And yeah. a lot of people don't ask that question. What, you know, what uh, most people ask, what if I fail? What if I screw up? What if it all goes to shit? But too few people ask, what if it did work? Yeah, that's what I'm and, betting on. I want yeah, it to work. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. So uh, tell us more about the coaching that you do. So I coach entrepreneurs on how mm -hmm. to work less and make more. And the, the way that I do that, I've got a, it's a kind of a idea called exit without exiting. Okay. And it came from my story because I started a company 12 years ago. Um, and I, well, it was about seven years into the process before I realized I'd created a prison for myself. Yeah. Um, it, it, the ironic prison of entrepreneurship is what I call it. And, and because we want freedom as entrepreneurs and we end up creating prisons for ourselves. And so I created that prison. And then I figured, well, how do I get out of this thing? And I didn't I didn't know because most people say, OK, if you want out, just sell the company. But, well, if you're the center of the company, you can't sell it, at least right. for not much money, because you're the middle of the company. Right. So I went on a journey. It took me about 18 months to figure out how to extricate myself from the center of that business by setting up systems and processes, investing in my people the correct way, making sure that, you know, our schedules were working right. And we had all this working correctly. And then I was able to pull off something I call exit without exiting, which is I exited daily operations without selling the company. So I still own it, still get paid, still have all the tax benefits, et cetera. As a matter of fact, I had a call, call from my, the guy that's running the CEO and my CFO today. They called and said, hey, we've got X number of dollars in our uh, 2021 revenue that we can either recognize this year or next year where do you want to recognize it and that's probably the most detailed question i've had in the entire year like i don't i just don't get involved and now i take that concept and i've distilled it down to these four core strategies that okay. i teach other entrepreneurs on how to do what i did because i think all of us want to get out of that ironic prison of entrepreneurship and get onto the free life that we really wanted to begin with well a lot of people you know they uh they want to run a business and it ends up the business is running them. Yep, hundred uh, percent. Okay, that that happened to me, uh, and happens to a lot of people. But the one thing that popped in my mind when you were talking about that, because I'm I'm thinking of my daughter, uh, who's a business owner, my stepdaughter, who's a business owner, 
um, they have not broke through to the next level for one huge reason. They are both control freaks. Uh, and, and I tell them both all the time, because I used to be that way. You have got to trust people. You know, you, 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 you always want to keep your toe in the water, but you've got to relinquish control because you can't do everything. You can't be everything. And do you run into this problem when you're talking to your clients? Because a lot of these people, you know, have got to be control freaks. Yeah. I, I call it the hero syndrome. Mm -hmm. And it's the first lesson in my eight week course on how to exit without exiting. Um, it's you have to stop being the hero. You know, as entrepreneurs, we show we love to show up with the cape on and the big S on our chest and solve problems and everybody claps. Yeah. And we love that because it makes us feel good. But it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. We are worried about what they think of us. Mm -hmm. And so we want to show up and be the hero. And so uh, entrepreneurs show up and be the hero. Now, at first, you have to be because you, you're the founder. You got to be the hero. But it, very shortly thereafter, you have to begin starting to take the cape off and handing it to other people and say, listen, you've got to be the ones to handle this. So those control freaks I call heroes because it's a little bit more positive spin yeah. on the yeah. terminology. But it's the same thing, right? It's yeah, exactly. trying to control everything, micromanage everything and do everything. Why? Here's why, because they are better at it. I mean, that's the truth that your daughter, you know, she's better at it than other people. But but here's the issue. I, did, I don't care if you're better at it or not. You're never going to grow out of your company unless you let other people be better at it. That's and right. so I teach this six steps del to delegation thing. So my whole first two lessons are all on delegation. And I show you if you do these six things. You will learn how to delegate and you will step out of the hero syndrome and let your business actually grow beyond you. Because if it never grows beyond you, the, your business is always you. You know, that's it. You don't get anything else. There's no lifetime. Style, there's no lifestyle that you get. There's no freedom that you get. It's all about you. No, I mean, I mean, yeah, and, and it does. It takes other people there. There is not one self-made person walking the earth. Somebody got help from somebody. Um, and, and, and whoever is mega, mega successful really has a lot of help from a lot of people, either people that have helped them out of, out of kindness, out of mentorship or people that help them run the day to day of their business. And, uh, and without that help, it, it, it's, it's just impossible. Back when I was traveling so much, I mean, I, I was gone four months a year. And my business just kept running, running, running. Um, I, you know, I, I could spend two hours looking at, uh, at email, answering a few things. And, you know, I could be sitting in Dubai or Indonesia or anywhere, do that. And I'm done. Everything's smooth. The money's still coming in. But had I tried just to run the business myself, I'd still be stuck here. Yep. And, 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 and like you said, um, not being able to enjoy the business, uh, the, the benefits of the business and, and, you know, rather than just being a slave to it. Yeah. That, that slavery of entrepreneurship is so prevalent and it sucks. You know, I, 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 you know, I want to help emancipate these entrepreneurs who are stuck. And that's, that's kind of what I talk. That's what I talk about all the time. It's what I coach on. I'm, I'm speaking at TEDx this summer and uh, I'm, that's my talk. <laughs> I'm, oh, wow. Everything I talk about is this. Wow. Wow. I've, um, I've got a, I've got a speaking engagement actually tomorrow. Uh, I have to fly up to Charlotte with a, it's a group of our agents that we call top gun. These are the top agents that, that, that we have. And, um, and, and, you know, we had to delegate that whole meeting. Uh, we had to delegate everything out and, and, uh, they said, what do you want to talk about? And I said, well, you know, you, you tell me what to talk about because I, you know, I've just got too much going on. So we're, uh, so they told me that they wanted to talk about abundance. And uh, I've been thinking about a lot about, you know, uh, you know, you either operate from abundance or you operate from, from scarcity and to get to the levels that you're coaching your, your clients to, you're definitely operating or giving them the mindset or teaching them the mindset of operating out of abundance. Because if you're doing it all yourself, if you're doing, if you're doing all the work, if you're carrying it all the load, that's, you're definitely operating from scarcity and uh, 
nothing grows from scarcity. Nothing. Yeah. Well, when we when we believe that life is a zero sum game, that's scarcity, and that's why people can't live in abundance. They think that if if you win, I lose. And there there's all, all there's this saying in sales. You know, we you and I probably both know this that you know when you pitch the close, the next person to speak loses. And there's this idea that, you know, there, there's a loser. And I, and, and I understand the whole point of that, but yeah. there isn't a loser. There's a, there, there should be winners in every sales and every sale that happens. Yeah. The, the, the client should win because they're getting great value. And then the salesperson should win because they, they have provided value and are getting compensated for that value, not a win lose. And so as entrepreneurs and a lot of people they live their lives, this is zero sum game. In other words, there's only so many pieces of the pie. And if I get a piece, that means you don't. Or if you get a piece, it means I don't. And the reality is the pie is infinite. There's so, I mean, money is infinite. As much as I hate to admit that. I mean, we've printed what, 85% of the oh, money. Oh yeah, it's, it's out there. Yeah. And, like, and, and I got a question just kind of as an aside. Like, sure. If they can print money when they need money, why do we pay taxes? Just as that's a damn good question. It's a great question, right? That's a question. That's Once a you print some more, question. pay yourself, leave me alone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 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 Uh, boy, if it only worked that way. But um, yeah, yeah, the, the money thing, the money thing is 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 just nuts. I, I was talking, I had dinner the other night with a buddy of mine who own, owns a bunch of, uh, of of new car dealerships. And he was telling me how much money they had knocked down in the last couple of years. And, and, and it, it's just, it's unbelievable the, the money that they pulled down. And he says, you know, it's all from just the government, just printing it and printing it and printing it. Um, you know, we're, we're in process of, of buying a, a, a house down in, in Naples, Florida, and I'm kicking myself in the ass for not buying that house two years ago, because in two years, the houses have more than doubled down there. And still, they're just selling, selling, selling. Uh, there are some areas of Naples, I'm not kidding you, uh, some of the waterfront houses are going off at $3,000 a square foot. Oh, my God. That's more expensive than Beverly Hills. That's crazy. And, 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 and you just sit there and wonder, you know, you know, where, where does it all come from? In fact, right here where I live in Tampa, um, if you're looking at houses that are over a million dollars, um, a realtor won't even show you a house unless you can prove that you can pay cash for it because they don't, they don't want to be bothered with someone having to borrow money and risk risk, you know, uh, a closing because, uh, you know, a loan didn't go through or whatever. That's how competitive it is. But you, you, again, you have to ask yourself, where the hell's all this money come from? It's just being printed, man. I, I think if we, the, the government wants to give another stimulus, why don't you give me a tax stimulus? Why don't you just send me the money that you think I owe you? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'll just send it right back to you. <laughs> You know, and I, I heard, you know, I heard something the other day, though, that that really hit me, actually, it's something I saw on Instagram, and I, I don't remember who who put it out. But, you know, I, I try to operate from gratitude uh, as much as I can, not perfect, but I try. And there was this guy talking about the price of gas, you know, you know, I don't know where it is where you are, but here it's about five bucks a gallon. Okay. And what he was talking about, he said, instead of me complaining about how much the price of gas is, I'm just grateful that I can buy it. I'm grateful that, that, that I have the money to buy it, that I, that, that I can do, you know, I can do this and that. And I thought about that and, and it's actually true. Um, if, if you ride around here and get out on the water back behind my house, uh, you you see boats running around. You know, marina gas is probably seven bucks a gallon now. People are, are riding around like it's seventy cents. But you know, but it's it's to be grateful for the thing. It's not so much how much it is, but having the gratitude of being able to to afford it, to be able a, yeah. to do that. It, it, it it's an interesting take. Well, it's a good perspective to have. And it goes back to what we were talking about originally. It's about mindset and what your out, outlook or you live in abundance or scarcity. Mm -hmm. It's hard not to be mad at what the system is doing to people because like 
you and I, we have the means to be able to do it. We can show gratitude, but there's lots of people that don't have that meat. They don't have those means. And the difference in a couple hundred dollars a month in gas is a couple hundred dollars a month in groceries or healthcare or taking their kids to, you know, to to do things. And, and, and it's out of control. I'm grateful that I can afford it. I'm grateful that I can drive and not worry about it. But I'm also worried that, you know, the last two years that what our governments have done to, to the poor and disenfranchised has been, it's reprehensible. And, and, and for what? For power, for, for namesake, for, for recognition. You know, all they're doing is hurting the people they say they love the most. I don't, under, I don't understand that. I, I, I don't understand it either because it, it would seem to me, and I don't like to talk about politics, but it would seem to me the people that voted for the current administration are the ones that are getting the least benefit. Yeah, absolutely. From the, from, from them. It, it, it really looks that way to me. Yeah, you know, the, pe- the people that, yeah, the people that are, you know, you know, that want all this equity and, you know, they want, they want economic equity and all that stuff. It I, I, actually, from where I'm sitting, it looks like uh, for them, it's actually gotten worse. Yeah, well, it, it is. And, and what's funny, too, is I was I was driving around yesterday. I went, a friend of mine had a birthday party and we went out to have dinner and drinks. And then afterwards, we were driving over to a cigar shop, have a cigar. And, 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 and I was looking around at the cars at the time of night, you know, and I'm like, and what the gas is five dollars a gallon. What are these people doing? And they're not they're, they're not Priuses. I mean, they're, these are big diesel trucks running around. I have a diesel truck, too. And I, I'm like, what, what are these people doing? And it doesn't seem like I, don't, I haven't noticed a slowdown with the mm-hmm. gas prices the way they are. And I think maybe, you know, maybe that's what they were hoping for is to say, hey, we just need to get them used to this. They've been two years cooped up in their houses. Let's pay gas really expensive because they're going to pay it because they just want to get out of the house. Well, I don't know. You know, we were, you know, and this to me, the, I, when I was having dinner with my car guy, he, we were talking about Toyota Priuses. And he said that now that gas has gone up, you know, to whatever, that some of the dealers are popping 15 grand above sticker on Priuses and selling them just as fast as they could get them on the lot. And, and, I, and, and I'm sitting there thinking to myself, how stupid is that? Because <laughs> the, 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 they will, they will, they'll have to drive that car to the wheels fall off before they make up any difference between paying this enormous number for the car versus the gas savings on, on the car that they're taking an ass kicking on that they're trading in. But, but people don't look at it that way. They just look at how much money is going out, what their credit card bills are, are every month. You know, they're, they're looking at, at what am I paying now? They don't, they don't, they don't look at what, at the long term of what this is going to do yeah it, um, it, short term thinking man it's crazy yeah it's it's absolutely it's absolutely nuts people people get so short-sighted on on what's going on now they get it, it, instead of looking looking towards the future and 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 in business people are people are certainly guilty of that of of of, of you know it, like if we didn't have a war going on in Ukraine and I'm that's near and dear to me because that's where my wife's from. She has family over there. She calls them every day. You know, my wife's just a wreck because of the, uh, all the stuff going on over there. But, you know, you have to wonder if, if you, if, if it wasn't in, you know, if we didn't have this thing going on in Ukraine, which seems to dominate everything in the news, then what the hell else would they be talking about? I guarantee it would be something. And it would be something that everyone would have this whole 911 mentality about. You know, it, 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 it's almost like, you know, the powers that be are holding the laser pointer and all these people are the cats just <laughs> following it around. <laughs> That's the people that watch the news. That's what yeah. they're doing. You're just a cat and they're the laser pointer. Oh, yeah. We we went to a we went to a Christmas party uh, the NBC affiliate was having here in Tampa. Uh, my wife advertises with them, and I, I met a couple of nice young ladies there, and they told me that they were news anchors. And I said, I, I'm sorry, I, I should know you, but I don't because I never watch the news. And they both looked at me and said, You're better off for it. Just don't even turn the TV on. Well, at it, least it, they're it, honest. They they I, are. 
I think the news has moved into immoral, the category of immorality, because oh. they, they were they were dabbling in unethical behavior for a while. Now I think it's full on immoral. I haven't watched the news in the decade. Oh. I just don't do it. It's just, it's, it's, it's I, and I think they're moving into the immoral category and I just don't, I don't like what they're doing to this country. No, you know what, uh, there was an, I, I forget, <laughs> it, it wasn't this one, it was a different news outlet that had reached out to my wife's daughter, who's also from Ukraine. And uh, they wanted my wife to come over there and some other Ukrainians to come over to talk about the war, interview them in my, my stepdaughter's house. And they got everything set up and they started talking and they said, wait a minute, can, can you like cry? Can you like, like plead and, you know, and, and all this shit. And, uh, they're, you know, I don't know if you know any, any Russians or Ukrainians, these are not crying and, and pleading people. They are wired differently, you know, basically told them to, you know, get the hell out of the house. We're not doing, you know, we don't do that. You know, you know, my wife is one of these people that, you know, the body scanners at the airport, she will not do it because like just standing there holding up her hands, she says, no, we don't give up. So, <laughs> she, <laughs> she, you know, they, they don't do that. But but the news wants to manufacture all this drama and 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 the sad, you know, I know the difference in it, you know, but unfortunately, most of John Q. Public believes this shit and it's yeah. terrifying it is crazy it is absolutely crazy i've been joking with friends of mine for the last two years because they know i don't watch the news and then of course the pandemic you know happened and yeah then, and they've been sitting around talking and they're jason where where do you get your news and i would say tiktok and they would just laugh at me and i said well listen don't hear me out I think TikTok's legit. TikTok. Now, there certainly there's some BS out there on TikTok too, but for the most part, what you're seeing on TikTok is is, is news reports of things that are actually going on. I mean, when they, yeah. when when they were telling us that the hospitals were overrun and everything was going on because of COVID, there were people walking through the hospital hallways and around the parking lots and, and with a cell phone saying, "Look, they're like like the news is saying that there's a problem, and I'm showing you right now there isn't a problem," and so. I, I realize I could also get misinformation there. So I'm not so naive to believe that yeah. anybody with a cell phone tell me the truth, but I know the news ain't telling me the truth. No, I know no. that. Like no. I, that's hundred percent. You know, it's like here in Florida when, you know, when a hurricane comes, they'll show all this devastation, but what they're not telling you is they're showing you, they keep showing you different angles of the same two square miles or two square blocks of, of some trailer park that got hit. They're not showing you everything else. They're just showing that. Yeah. It's sensationalism at its worst. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's terrible. Um, so what do you, uh, um, do you teach your people selling systems as well, Jason? Yeah, actually, um, so, so the four core strategies that I teach, okay. I have a, a program called the business accelerator okay. and it's an eight week course live coaching with me. Um, and then, and in lessons, I think it's five and six lessons, five and six are on the third core strategy, which is established systems and processes. And so the system and process that I can't deal with every system and process in an eight week class. Sure. But so, so I pick the cell system is the one that I pay attention to. So I've got a three part cell system that I teach uh, based on my, you know, two 25 years worth of, of very successful selling. I've sold $25 million worth of goods and products and services wow. over those years. And I, I, I've developed a pretty tight cell system. And so it starts with why do people buy? And if you understand why people make buying decisions, you can craft your 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 speech or not your speech, but your pitch in such a way sure. that it that hits all those four reasons. And then I talk about I, I, I developed this thing called a 20 point matrix, which is a prospecting system that I used at several of my companies. And I now teach all my clients to use it. And okay. it's a way to identify your ideal customer within five minutes of meeting with somebody. And it's, it's based on data. And it's really, really interesting information, but I teach that. And then the third piece is the perfect sales sequence, which is a seven step sequence that if you take your, you can take your current process, but just make sure you sequence in this order, you'll close 40 to 50% more deals just following the sequence. So that, yes, I definitely teach that in my, in my system. Do you teach, uh, see, I, I'm a firm believer that most purchases people make, it doesn't matter if it's insurance, car, 
you know, a steak at Ruth's Chris, at whatever. It's an emotional sale. It, re it really is. I think almost any sale is emotional. And it, it always, you know, baffled me. You know, everyone knows this, but it baffles me as to why people don't want to use emotions in the sales process. Now, you know, our primary business is life insurance. And trust me, that that is an emotional sale. Um, but do, do you teach that as well about, yeah. about you, using emotions? Because a, a lot of people are hesitant to do it because they have these preconceived notions in their head of what their customer is going to think and whatnot. And, you know, I'm a big believer in instead of selling them to help them. And when you're helped, you know, nobody likes to be sold. Everyone likes to be helped. And when you're helping them, you're showing them the value of what it is. And, and oftentimes the value to them is worth more than the money they're going to hand you. Yeah. I, the, as a matter of fact, you're hundred percent right. Every decision we make is made emotionally and justified logically. You think about buying a hamburger or a Ruth Chris steak, you first go, wow, that looks good. I, that would make me feel good. I would love that. And that's an emotional decision. And then you look at the yeah. price and you justify it. Well, it's dinner time and I could afford it, so I will buy it. But it could be dinner time and you could afford it, but not be hungry and you won't make the decision. Like emotions drive the decisions and logic justifies that decision. Buying a house is the same way. So you walk into a house, you fall in love with the house, you emotionally make the decision to purchase it. And you're like, can I afford it? Can I get the mortgage? Yes. And then you justify it logically. So in, in my seven steps of this perfect sell sequence, step four is establish the emotional reasons to buy. So they've got, there's got to be an emotional reason for them to buy. If you can't establish an emotional connection, the likelihood of you making a sale is not, is really low. You know, I, I was just thinking, I was, uh, I think I was in Spain. We walked in a restaurant. I don't know if you've ever been to, to, to Spain or, or not, Europe, no. um, but you, their, their menus are way different. Like, uh, like if it's chicken, you know, if you, if, if you go to almost any restaurant here, you know, it'll, it'll say what part of the chicken and it'll, 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 it'll have, you know, all this nice descriptions on it. Um, in Spain, it just says pollo chicken. That's it. Just chicken. You don't know what it is, what part of the chicken it is. You know, if it's, you know, if it's baked, fried, whatever. And, and it, it it's so funny. I was thinking about that because when you go, you go to the restaurants and the, and the servers, you know, you know, start telling you about the specials, the way that they describe them evoke such emotions. You're like, well, yeah, no, I don't want one. I want all three. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, but you know, they, they, a lot of a lot of these good restaurants have really gotten great at invoking emotions and whatnot. But, but unfortunately, for a lot of salespeople and a lot of businesses and whatnot, you know, they they just commoditize whatever it is that they're doing, and they're leaving so much money on the table by not bringing out emotions and showing the clients what the value it is that they're going to have, how it's going to benefit hit them, how it's going to solve their problems, how it's going to uh, improve their life. Mm -hmm. You're hundred percent right. I have nothing to add to that because it's hundred percent right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They, they just don't do it. But do, do you have a hard time with your clients uh, or not a hard time, but do, do you, do you bring in clients and you tell them this stuff and they go, Holy shit. I never thought of that. Yes, it's it's funny how so many people have been uh, moderately successful with no plan. <laughs> they just don't have a plan on selling. But 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 this is the cool thing: when you hire a coach, when you put a system in place, if you have been moderately successful, your success is going to skyrocket. If you've been sucking, you're going to be moderately successful, and that gives you the opportunity to go. So I yes, I, I people all the time they're like, oh, we never even thought about this. But then when I explain it to them in their own life, like, why did you buy those boots? And they'll say, oh, well, you know, and they start giving me the reasons. And like, well, where did you buy them? How did you buy them? When did you buy them? What do you feel about them now? And they will agree. You know what? I did. I bought these boots because it was an emotional decision. And then I justified it with logic. Well, then why do you think that the person buying the swimming pools that you're building are going to make a different decision making process than that? They're going to make the same decision buying a pool, a life insurance policy, a light bulb, mm -hmm. 
a watch. It doesn't matter. They're going to go through the same process. That's why I teach that perfect cell sequence is it'll take them through. If you sequence your cells just like this, it takes a human through the normal process of making a decision and you're going to close more deals because they're interested in buying or they wouldn't be talking to you. So now you just yeah. got to pull all these things out and you, you close the deal. You know, and, and you said it, that, that, you know, coaching is so important. Um, you know, uh, you know, every, every success, like every successful athlete, uh, you know, golfer, football player, whatever, they have a coach. If you, if you play golf, which I don't play golf, but you know, if you, if you start playing and you start doing things a certain way and you can't straighten it out, you know, you can't see you doing it. It takes an outside influence to, to, to show you what you're doing wrong and correct you. Uh, you know, and oftentimes a coach, you know, as I like to say, will call you out on your shit. And, and, you know, the, the, I have someone that coaches me and, and I got to tell you, he is not a nice guy at all. But he calls me out on my shit, and 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 he, you know, he's like, no, you're you're doing it the wrong way. Well, I like it that no, that you're you're a dumbass. Do it this way. You know, you need to do it this way. But but you know, everybody needs that, and I know your coaching program is 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 very successful and has helped a lot of people. If if people want that or people want to get a hold of you, how do they do it? Well, my, my main website is the real Jason because I am the real Jason Duncan. You can go look me up anywhere on social media, YouTube, wherever, but okay. my business accelerator that I've been talking about this whole time, you can find it on my website, but if you want to go straight to it and watch it, it's exit without exiting dot com exit without exiting dot com there's a video on there me kind of explaining what the process and the concept is all about and uh i would be honored to have any of your listeners join me for my next cohort i do those as a cohort model because i want us to learn together it's not just you hiring me one-on-one it's us working together as a group now of course if you want to hire me one-on-one i can do that too but but this group pro uh this group program it's a cohort mm -hmm. model we work together we do homework together we come back and discuss it together and we grow together and it's uh, some nice. great relationships have been built out of that uh people have done business with each other out of that it's uh it's phenomenal and this next one i got starting i've got i think four or five states um there, there i've had people from three or four different countries join it it's, it's such an interesting and eclectic group of people because they all want to accelerate themselves to success mm -hmm. Yeah, and and the relationships that you build with other people, with the other people that are that are in the program. Uh, I, I went to this boot camp one time, and I paid twenty five thousand dollars to go. And there was this guy who I'm really good friends with now. He said, "You know, uh, I don't know what I'm going to get out of this." And I said, "Well, there's fifty other people here that could afford to pony up twenty five thousand dollars." I said, "You you know that." It, it, <laughs> most people don't know 25 people that can folk that can pony up 25 grand just like that. I know most people don't. So just having the access to those kind of people uh, over and above the value that they get from, from any kind of coaching or boot camp or whatever is worth it. Yeah. Your network yeah. is your net worth. That, that, that is so, so, so important. A hundred percent. Well, Jason, man, I really appreciate uh, you coming on. I really enjoyed talking to you and getting your, getting your perspective on, uh, on, and, and learning more, quite frankly, about the programs that you offer. I know they're valuable and whatnot. Um, I follow, you know, you want to follow him on Instagram. He's got a great Instagram, uh, uh, at the real Jason Duncan. Am I right? Right. Yeah. Just like, just like the website and all that. And, uh, brother, I, I appreciate you and, uh, and appreciate you coming on today. Thank you, man. It's been an honor to talk to you. It's always fun. It, it is. It is. You have a good one. And, and, you know, like this, share this, tell everyone that you know about the podcast, go see J Jason. What's your podcast again? The root of all success, the root of all success, the root of all success. I like that. So you want to, you definitely want to subscribe to, to that podcast is on YouTube. It's on YouTube as well. YouTube as well. Okay. All right, Jason, appreciate you, brother. Thank you. Have a good one.